Good morning, good morning, good morning. Good morning, New Covenant. How's everybody doing this Sunday morning? We are so grateful to be here at this time, at this moment, for this is the day that the Lord has made. I said this day is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and we will be glad in it. The Lord graced us with his sunshine this morning just to let us know that he is God. He's a big God. There's nothing he cannot do. He will never leave us or forsake us. So we lift our hands and we praise you, God, today because you are worthy. New covenant, y'all need to get up on your feet and praise the Lord today because every single praise, every hallelujah, every thank you, Jesus, every Lord, I love you, every praise belongs to the Lord. Amen. Amen. We're about to praise him here today. You ought to join us. Come on, put your hands together. If you can't stand, just put your hands together and start right.
I can share something personal because of the way this this song struck me this morning. Melissa will understand, and I hope I can convey it. There's there's a spirit that's different, and in Mumford Adonia, there's a, a little church that wants us to come and be a part of their fellowship, and we go there. It's a brethren church, very very extremely legalistic. And when we go and visit, we always come depressed. And what you all, you, you, I, I just, you all don't realize what we have in New Covenant. You just don't realize because they'll sing about, they'll talk about Christ and the cross, but they stay there in that sorrow. They're just, the, all the women have to wear a covering over their head and they, it's all solemn and they're very, Every week, it's always, always heavy, depressing. Jesus died because I'm a sinner. Yes, yes, this is true. But the song reminds us that he got up and walked out. And I hope you, you see the joy that we have from that. And and we have two young ladies that are believers in Mumfredonia, and they they try to go, and, and they just want someone. They want a church so bad that is excited about the joy of him getting up out of the grave rather than staying in that sorrow. And so I I just, I I don't know, forgive me, but I just, you just don't know what we've got here at New Covenant. And we've got so much to be thankful for. I know it's been a tough week. I know there's been bad news. I know there's struggles. But you know what? The song also says, hope of a life spent with you. At the beginning of that song, you realize that that starts the day that you accept Christ as your Savior. That's not something that we only get when we're in heaven. It's, start, it's right now. So he's going to get us through whatever struggles you guys saw. And the joy that we have is not because we don't have struggles. It's because we know somebody's got these problems that we're facing. So let's take that attitude this morning and go to the Lord. We've got struggles. But just say, God, okay. I'm waiting. I'm anticipating something great from you. And look for that good news. The gospel is good news. And it's good news for a reason. It is good news. Let's go to the Lord this morning. Father, thank you. It's overwhelming when we think of our sin. Yes, it's overwhelming that it cost your son's life, that he had to come out of heaven and go through the hell that he went through for my sin. It's awful. But God, it doesn't stop there. You're such a gracious God. He got up out of the grave and He showed us what real love, He defined love for us. And He gives us hope and we can walk with Him, with our Creator today. Today is the day that you have given us. Today you're involved in my life. Today you want to show me and reveal yourself. Today you want to give me peace that passes all understanding, surpasses all understanding. You have an answer for every problem that comes up into my life. And I thank you and I need to live in that today and walk in that. And I thank you for reminding us through this song that the praise team is sung. Now, I also pray that you help me to see in the message that I'm about to hear another characteristic in the security in the, in that we have in you when we place our faith in you, no matter what's going on in our life, that we stand in faith believing that this Savior who created the world 
is here is my personal friend who loves me and is going to walk me through anything this world throws at me. Thank you, Father. How could I not be filled with praise? And it's in your holy name I pray. Amen. Uh, I just want to just proclaim before the Lord and just say thank you, God, for all your goodness, for all your mercy, for all the undeserved blessings, for your covering. God has been so good. Everybody in this room has a story, and we don't know each other's story, but through it all, God has been good. He wasn't just good this morning. He didn't stop being good yesterday. He was good since before the foundation of this world. He was good over 2,000 years ago when he sent his son to die for our sin. God has been good for a very long time. It's times when you don't know what he's doing. What is the day to God? What is the year to God? He made them all. His timing is always right and he's good. So this song is, you have been good for a long time. We love you, Lord.
Faith. What is it? Being sure of our hope. Convinced of what we can't see. By faith, we understand the world was set in order at God's command. By faith, Abel offered God a greater sacrifice than Cain, and for his faith, God commended him as righteous. By faith, Noah trusted God and constructed an ark for the deliverance of his family. By faith, Abraham was willing to sacrifice Isaac, his only son, believing God would still fulfill his promises. By faith, Moses chose to be mistreated with the people of God rather than enjoy sin's fleeting pleasure. By faith, God's chosen nation crossed the Red Sea on dry ground and praised him as it swallowed up the Egyptians. By faith, Rahab the prostitute escaped destruction because she welcomed the spies in peace. Time will fail me if I tell of Gideon, David, and the prophets. By faith, they administered justice, shut the mouths of lions, quenched raging fire. But others were imprisoned, murdered, and wandered in deserts, mountains, and openings in the earth. We are surrounded by this great cloud of witnesses. So get rid of every weight, of every sin, and run, run with endurance the race set before us. Your eyes fixed on Jesus. He is the champion and guide of our faith. For promised joy, he endured the cross, thought nothing of its shame, and having risen again, has been handed his deserved glory at the right hand of the throne of God. Fire Sam and the praise team. We're hiring back, but we're going to fire them <laughs> just on principle. I don't know why y'all do that before I got to come up here. That's just, that's just wrong. That's all I got to say. Whew. I had to get myself together. My goodness. I don't know about y'all. <laughs> but has God been good to you? Has, has God been faithful to you? Has God opened doors for you? Is God still working in your life? All your life has he been faithful. my life. He's been so good. You get a door closed and you think, oh man, this is it. I can't, I can't get what I need. And then God says, that's the wrong door. I got another one open for you. Haven't I been good to you? Haven't I been faithful? Why are you worried? I got this. All my life. He's been faithful. I hope I can get through this thing. Folks, this uh, last two weeks, for us personally as a family, we've gone through a lot of different little nagging things. And uh, one of the things, a big thing, I won't go into any detail about it, but when we came to the end of ourselves, 
someone didn't want to give us a refund for something that they didn't follow through on, and it took them two and a half weeks of me trying to get in touch with them to get our, well, get God's money back. Because, see, I don't have any money that belongs to me. Everything I have belongs to God. And so that morning when I came back from church on Saturday, I believe it was, honey, uh, no, Friday, whatever, and I said, honey, those people are trying to keep God's money. However, it's his, and he's going to get it. And don't you know, the Holy Spirit said, call them again. I got on the phone, called them again, and I got the right person that I needed to talk to about my refund. I said, now, y'all owe me some money, and I ain't got it yet. Y'all told me on the 26th that I was going to get it. 29th was going to be overnighted. I ain't got it yet. And this is August. That was back in July. And God said, all my life, all your life, I've been faithful. Now, you just think about all the times that I came through for you. He says, I got this. And when I picked up the phone, left the message, less than five minutes later, a person called me back and said, I am sorry, I apologize. But you know, through the whole situation, never once did I get irritable with the person on the phone. I didn't act ugly. I, you know, I, I, I acted like a Christian, like a believer, because my response was a witness to them about the God I serve. And so, wh however I acted would, would, would look, it would either look good or bad on God, and I wasn't going to let God look bad. So, I came the way of grace. I just figured somebody is out of their mind if they think they can keep my money. Because, I, I, look, I would shake heaven and hell to get God's money. And, uh, and had everybody on notice that I wanted to have on notice to get it back. And then they said, we will overnight it to you, definitely FedEx on Monday. And you get it Tuesday. If you don't get it Tuesday, you call me back, and I want to find out why. Now, that's the kind of God I serve. Amen? That's why when, when they were singing that song, it just reminded me of what I said to my wife as we were walking through the kitchen. I said, honey, that's God's money. And not ours. It's his money. He gave it to us to be stewards over. And so we've been good stewards over trying to help our son. And you know, if you're trying to help your baby, you better give me my money uh, I mean, I mean, you know, our son, our son's in jeopardy. You know, he's got some things he needs to take care of, and uh, you know, you done took baby's money. That ain't gonna happen. We we gonna we gonna fight a little bit on that one now. I mean, not literally, but you know, I'm gonna fight in the spirit, and that's how we fought this thing. We fought it in the spirit, and God has shown me over and over again that He's been faithful. And there have been doors of opportunity that have opened to me in my life. And that's where we are today And uh, in the story of Noah. I know there are many metaphors for doors. There's the door of opportunity. And then uh, there is, uh, uh, people say, well, when, when one door opens, uh, another one closes and, and all of that. And, and, and here's an intriguing one that I, <laughs> I thought about. The doors of the church are open. Now, I, I know, you know, when people say that, it's a figure of speech, but the average person that comes to church don't know what you mean when you say the doors of the church are open. They figure, well, wait a minute. I was already walking in the door of the church that was open. It wasn't locked. Was it locked? Is it, what, what did they do? It, it, it's, it's a figure of speech, but see, people who are not church babies don't know what that means. And we say a lot, of, a lot of little religious stuff. People don't know what we're talking about. It says, oh, you know, but, but, but what Jesus is saying uh, to us through this whole door business is that Jesus says, I am the door. And he is using it as a figure of speech, and he is the door singularly, 
pointing out the exclusive nature of his door. He's not a door, a door. He is the door. So if you want to get to heaven, you can't go through any other door but the door. Now, it's a person and it's it's the entrance into this particular place where there is eternal life is only by faith. His door of opportunity during this grace period that we're in right now is always open to those who will by faith enter in through that door to be saved. Are we always open as a church? Well, you know, thanks to an EPB with their new phone system that we paid a lot of money for, but, you know, we had the one and we got the, we had the one in, that, that we got in 1996 when we started, so we needed to get something new because we were just missing some, some things. But I love the, the kind of system that we have now, so if you call and no one's here and you leave a message, sp- sp- particularly with me, uh, I will immediately get an email and your number and the voicemail will come directly into my mailbox and I will be able to listen to you as soon as you hang up. So you don't have to wait if you call on the weekend for me to get back to you because I will get back to you immediately because as soon as you hang up the phone from leaving me a message, it immediately sends me an email letting me hear the message and letting me know your voice, hear your voice rather, that you're sending to me, and it, it, it's so revolutionary, and I'm so glad about it because, see, uh, a lot of times people have passed through the week, during the week, and we didn't know anything about it. They leave a message. Our secretary, uh, my, my personal secretary, Andrea, she's out, you know, on the weekends. She's, she, she's gone somewhere else. She's out of town. She, they work in the summer, Monday through Wednesday, and the winter, Monday through Thursday, and they are part-time, and Andrea comes in afternoon, and Reba comes in in the morning, and they have it all worked out. Carlos is here most of the time, but we were missing messages, and this thing gives us the opportunity to be able to be open 24-7. So if there's ever uh, an emergency, and you leave them, you, you got to get in touch with the church, you, you just press my 112, and you will get me, and I'll get that message immediately, because we want to stay in touch with our church because things have happened that we have, that have felt, fallen through the cracks, man. And, 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 I, and I, took, I took the weight of it because I'm the pastor. I'm supposed to take the weight of it, even though it wasn't my fault. I threw myself under the bus because I needed to take care of that. And, and so somebody had to, had to take the blame. And so I'm the one who takes the blame for whatever goes wrong. When things go right, I give everybody else the credit. I don't take the credit for the stuff that goes right. But when it goes wrong, it comes back to me. But we now can be 24-7. I love that because we're always open. We don't never have to say the doors of the church are open. They're always open. Anytime you need anything here, you can just call us and, and, and let us know. But one day, the door of opportunity for you, if you're not born again, watching us online to be saved it's going to shut tight, and you're going to miss out on being saved because the day of, of, of grace is right now, and after this age of grace is subsided or has passed away, then you will not be able to be saved if you've ever heard the gospel. And I know you asking, well, where is that in the Bible? And I'm glad you did because I'm going to show you in the Bible where it is. Doors have symbolic and spiritual significance. We're going to explore the profound spiritual significance of why Jesus is the singular door to salvation as symbolized in the story of Noah's Ark. Last week, we saw how Noah found favor with God, and by faith and obedience to God, he built the ark. Today, we're going to look at the significance of the single door in the ark. The ark's door was several things. One, the only way in and out of the ark. Two, the only means of escape from judgment. Three, the only way to be saved. And 
if you want to be born again, there's only one way to heaven, and it is through the only door that Jesus says he is. He is the only door. My uh, first observation is the proclamation of punishment that God gives in Genesis chapter 7 and verse 4. It says, for after seven more days, I will send rain on the earth 40 days and 40 nights, and I will blot out from the face of the land every living thing that I have made. Now, God is not very pleased with these people because, as I told you last week, what had happened, but I, the phrase I will is very important. I will speaks of the surety of the punishment. The word destroy or wipe means this it gives us the severity of the punishment. And then the death of every living thing that he has created gives us the scope of the punishment. My second observation is God's patience before the punishment. In verse 10 of chapter 7, it says, It came about after seven days that the water of the flood came upon the earth. In the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, on the 17th day of the month, by the way, 100 years have passed, and when Noah first talked to God, it was, he was 500, now he's 600. On the same day, all the fountains of the great deep burst open, and the floodgates of the sky were open. The rain fell upon the earth for 40 days and 40 nights. And God is getting ready to judge everything that breathes and everything that lives. Now, I studied the whole aspect of this rain and all this and how it came about, and archaeologists believe there was a gigantic shifting of the Earth's crust causing the ocean's floor to rise and break up their reservoirs of subterranean waters. The, water, the surface of the Earth, the manner and longevity of life were changed by this seismic activity. But God provided Noah protection from punishment. In verse 13, it says, On the very day, Noah and Shem and Ham and Jepheth, the sons of Noah, and Noah's wife, they never give her a name, and three wives of the sons with them entered the ark, they and every beast after its kind. Now, when you see the word kind, it does not mean species. It means kind. Well, what does kind mean? It means they had all of the genetic properties to create other kinds of dogs, other kinds of animals, every kinds of things. They had in each one of them the genetic properties to create anything in the dog family, anything in the horse family. And, 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 and I believe, now I don't, I, I don't know this for sure, but I, I just believe that God placed into Adam that same kind of genetic thing. Because how else can you figure out how we all look differently? Some of us are black, some of us are white. How does that happen? How does that happen? I believe if he did it with the genetic properties in these animals, and he had to have done it through Adam before that was all done. And so that's why you see all of this. But I believe based on the study of, 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 of Noah's sons that each one of them represented every race that we have now. And I studied it, and I went through it, as I told you uh, some years ago, and it made sense. As you look up the names of each one of the sons, you will discover that each one of them have the same kind of genetic property that all of the folks that we have in the world. And uh, that's why we all came from the same person. But we are different kinds of people. Thank God, you know. Uh, you know we, God is not into being same. He likes diversity. I mean, look around at you. Y'all diverse in, in every way. We all are. I mean, some sh short, tall, whatever. I mean, and light brown and, and white and green, purple, whatever. That's the hair, by the way. Uh, 
I think y'all have a little help with that. But uh, anyway, let me go back to my message before I get off message, because <laughs> y'all know how I am. <clears throat> uh, what's the next verse, Constance? Uh, so they went into the ark to Noah by twos of all flesh, in which was the breath of life. Those that entered, male and female, all flesh of all flesh, entered as God had commanded him, and the Lord closed the door behind him. Noah didn't close the door. So Noah couldn't open the door. If you would go to, the, to Kentucky and, and to, to the museum, you will see that there is no knob on the inside of the ark. There is no knob on the outside. God shut the door. And the only way you can open it is that God has to open it. So that shows me that when Jesus says he's the door, he means I'm the only one that will open up heaven for you. And when I open it up to pull you in, I will shut the door and keep you securely in me. And I'm secure in Christ. Now, my first point to, to ponder about the significance of the door is the notoriety of it. It pointed to Jesus, who is our way, our truth, and our door and our life. The ark's door was the only way that Noah and his family and every chosen creature that God had chosen could be saved. Just as there's only one door into the ark, there's only one door to get to God, and it's through Jesus Christ. Look at what it says in Acts chapter 4 and verse 12. It says, and there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which we must be saved. There's only one name that saves you. You can believe in whatever name you want to believe in, but I believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and him only and period. Now, if you believe, you know, that your God, whoever that God is, is greater than this God that's in the Bible that I read and believe in, uh, I, I, we, we, you know what? The truth will be in heaven. That's where all things will be settled in heaven. And I'm not going to argue with nobody about their God. Whoever you have the faith to believe in, fine. My faith, I believe in, uh, I believe in the God of the Bible. You may believe in the God of another Bible. Well, I don't know if there's another Bible yeah, of your book, whatever that book is. But uh, I believe in my Bible. So my second point to ponder <laughs> that's significant is the nature of it. It was consistently open. I thought about that. It was open to those who wanted to enter. But once everyone who was chosen entered, it was shut. So this speaks of the finality of God's patience before his judgment and punishment. Now, once the door of the ark is shut, there is no second chance to get in for those who are on the outside of the ark. Now, when God shut the door and the floods came, I can just about imagine a whole bunch of people going up that ramp that Noah went up, knocking on the door trying to get in, but couldn't. I can, I can imagine Noah in the ark and, and his children, wife and everybody else, hearing the cries and the screams of the people outside the door and they are crying out to Noah, asking him to open the door so they can come in because the water is getting too deep and some people can't swim. And then they've got these beasts in the, 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 the sea who will come and gobble them up. And you've got snakes. My wife hates snakes. 
She would have been in that door quick because she, she hey, ain't got to convince her more than once, you know. And water? No. I, I, mean, I remember she was telling me, she said, oh, my goodness, she's going to kill me when I get home. But <laughs> y'all pray for me. You know, y'all pray, and then I can come back to life. Uh, she, when she was learning how to swim, <laughs> she got in the pool, and, 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 and her instructor said, you know, if you go down, don't worry about it. All you got to do is like that, and you'll just come right back up again. And she said, uh-uh. They said, yeah, you will. So she jumped in, and she did like that, and she didn't go back up. And she did like that again, and it still didn't go up. And then by this time, the instructor realizes she ain't coming up. You know, no, well, I don't know what they call them, but, uh, but she was at, or whatever that is. And they threw the, she went in and get, to get my wife, because I was, I, I, I was going to sue her and they have my woman. <laughs> the YMCA would be, it'd be, it'd be, it'd be the, the Bernie Miller of CA. That's all. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. But, 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 but can you imagine all the people Noah preached for 100 years while he was building the ark? It was an object lesson to them that, wait a minute. First of all, folks, let me tell you something. The only rain that came was the midst of the ground, and nobody ever heard about rain. Some say it was kind of like the greenhouse effect. You know how that is. You, don't, you have sprinklers from the ground, you know, that comes up and, 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 and everything's taken care of that way. And so when God opened up the, the earth to allow the, 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 the streams of water under the earth to come up to hoist the, 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 the ark up before the rains came, that ought to tell you something about what God was doing all that time with creation. He was feeding everybody, and they didn't know anything about any rain. That's why I'm sure when he was telling people, it's going to rain, what are you talking about? That, that man know it crazy. What are you talking about? What is rain? Uh, what is water? Where does it come from? I mean, they didn't have a dictionary or Google to look it up, so I mean, they didn't understand what was happening. But one thing they did know is when Noah got in the ark, they knew that they couldn't get in. But today, the door of salvation is open wide. It's kind of like God's arms that are open wide to those who want to receive Christ. God just says, come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Look, just come to me. God's calling somebody. He's trying to get your attention. You pick up that phone and you go, this is God. First of all, why didn't you silence your phone? Number two. <laughs> okay, God, I'm hanging up right now. <laughs> is the age of grace, the age of the grace of God. But those who reject Jesus during this age of grace will be left behind when we are taken up to meet Jesus in the air. You say, well, pastor, I don't believe that. Well, I'm going to show you. Will you believe it if I showed you in the Bible? 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. It says, now we request you, brethren, with regard to the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him, that you not be quickly shaken from your composure or be disturbed either by a spirit or the message or a letter as if from us to the effect that the day of the Lord has come. In other words, it hadn't come. Let no one in any way deceive you. For it will not come unless the apostasy comes first. That's when there's a great turning away from biblical truths and everything else. I mean, it, 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 a lot of that is happening today, but it's just in the beginning stages. And the man of lawlessness 
is revealed. That's speaking of someone who says, I can bring peace to the, earth, to the world, and, uh, and they will raise themselves up, and people will come and, and, and rally behind that person. He will be the son of destruction who opposes and exalts himself above every so-called God or object of worship so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, displaying himself as being God. So he's going into the, 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 one of the, the, the great temples in Israel, and he's going to set up shop, and he is going to be in there. It doesn't have any right to be in there. Do you not remember that while I was still with you, I was telling you these things, and you know what restrains him now, so that in his time he will be revealed. For the mystery of the lawless is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. Well, who is restraining him? The answer is the Holy Spirit. Well, how is he restraining him? Because we are still here. As long as the Holy Spirit is in us and we're still here, then everybody is safe. But when they see us and our clothes on the ground and we're gone up in the air to meet God in the air, all hell is going to break loose because, see, it's because of us still being here that the world has not gone completely crazy because the Holy Spirit is restraining them because of us, because God will not do anything to judge sinners as long as we are here. God does not judge sinners and saints the same. He, does, he takes us out of the way so that he can judge people who rejected Jesus Christ. Then that lawless one will be revealed whom the Lord will slay with the breath of his mouth. Now, y'all think, people say, I'm going to stomp on the devil. I'm gonna, you know what God's going to do? He's going to say, get out of here. That's the breath of his mouth. And bring to an end by the appearance of his coming. That is, the one whose coming is in accord with the activity of Satan, with all power and signs and false wonders. So he's going to have some signs, you know, and do the little tricks. And with all the deception of wickedness for those who perish, because here is a purpose, because they did not receive the love of the truth, who is the truth, by the way, who's Jesus Christ, so as to be saved by what? The truth. For this reason, God will send upon them a deluding influence so that they will believe what is false because they rejected the truth in order that they all may be judged who did not believe the truth but took pleasure in wickedness. Folks, if you do not know the Lord Jesus Christ and you are playing around right now thinking, I got time there is nothing that's keeping Jesus from coming today. He has satisfied all the prophecy that needed to be satisfied. There is nothing that he has to do. There's nothing he's waiting on. He's waiting on God's time. He's waiting because he doesn't want any to perish. He doesn't want anyone that he has created who's heard the gospel to turn away from the gospel continuously. He is patient with us. He's patient with you. He's patient with me. And God is saying, I just want to give him a little bit more time. Well, that's the grace of God. And if you haven't given your life to Christ, that's the grace of God that you're messing with. And right now, his mercies are what's keeping you alive. Because he doesn't want anyone to perish. He wants all to be saved. Whosoever will, he wants them to come. Now, back to this store business. In Matthew 25, Jesus tells the parable of ten virgins. Now, 
The five were wise, and they brought oil for their lamps. But the foolish ones, they didn't bring oil for their lamps. And so the parable is the foolish ones left the wise ones to go into town to get some oil for their lamps because the wise ones wouldn't give up some of their oil. They said, no, we're not giving you none of ours. You better go get your own. And so they, while they were at the store <laughs> getting the oil, the bridegroom comes in. And the wise virgins were ready, and they went in with him to the marriage feast. And then the Bible says the door was shut. When the foolish virgins came later and asked to be let in, the bridegroom said, Truly I say to you, I do not know you. Why? Because the parable is the wise people who are faithful, God knows. The foolish people who are playing around with religion, God doesn't know you. Oh, I go to church every day. Yeah, fine. I read the Bible every day. Fine. Yeah, okay. But do you know Jesus? Do you have a relationship with him? I mean, a lot of people, my wife said, you know, somebody said they know you. I said, really? He said, yeah. And uh, I said, well, who are they? And they, she told me the name. You know him? I said, no, no. See, a lot of people say they know Jesus. But does Jesus know you? See, I know he knows me. Because he spoke to me this morning. Through his spirit. He speaks to me all the time. I was telling my wife, I said, honey, you know, I get up in the morning, I want to be all spiritual. Oh, Lord, here I am again. I'm praying. And, Lord, I'm praying about the message you're going to give me. And as soon as I start praying, he starts giving me things that he wants me to write down. I told my wife, I said, you know, whenever I want to talk to him about something, you know, he starts giving me stuff to write down. And then she said, she looked at me, she said, write it down, baby. <laughs> you know, it takes me long to figure stuff out. That's why God gave us wives. Because they got a lot of sense. We just ain't got half the stuff they got. They got double what we got, and I'm glad I got her to lean on. Lord have mercy. But you know what? The Spirit speaks to us. Whenever you need the Spirit, He'll speak to you. You know what Jesus told the, his disciples is, look, when they bring you before the authorities, don't worry about what you're going to have to say. Don't worry about what words you're going to have to say. The Spirit will tell you at that very moment what you need to say. And that has happened to me over and over and over again. I mean, in, in my flesh, I wanted to tell those people something about what was on my mind. But my mind just wouldn't go to that dirty place. You know why? Because the Holy Spirit had control of my tongue and my mind. And, 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 and because he was in control, I didn't want to embarrass him. And I, and, and I was going to try to be as nice as possible because I'd given it to God. God, this is your money. Okay, you need to get this for us because, you know, our son, you know, he said, ask, seek, and, you know, knock. And, I, and I'm asking, I'm seek, and I'm, hello. Uh, I, I know you're here. I, I, I see you, son. It just been, my third point to ponder that's significant is the security of the door. Once Noah, his family, and the chosen animals had entered the ark, God shut them in. They were safe and secure. I love that song. From all alarms. Why? Because they were leaning on God. They were trusting in him. Do you know that Noah and his kids did not have to feed all of the animals. God had provided a way for the food to come, drop down every day for them to eat. Do y'all understand how God took care of that? Because people say, well, how, how did they have to feed all those animals? They didn't have to. God had already worked all that out in, in, in the construction of the ark. It's all at the museum in Kentucky. And someone said, Pastor, we probably need to go up there. Yeah. We probably do. I mean, some of us, we, we, it would be a, a, a wonderful thing to, to see in person because then you can see the Bible come to life because they made it according to Scripture. And, uh, and I hope, you know, one day that, that, that you can go there and maybe we can go or whatever. I don't know, but uh, it's not on my to-do list right now. I've got some other things I'm trying to get done here at the church. But, uh, you know, and when God says so, I, I'll, I'll, I'll do whatever he wants me to do. But 
The ark is a picture of our security in Christ. It's a picture of our security in Christ, and nothing can snatch us out of his hand, and nothing can ever separate us from his love. So when you're in the ark, who is a picture of Christ, or that is a picture of Christ, and, and, and he's the door to the ark, so you get in through him, and then you're secured in him when you get into him. So nothing can ever separate you from him. My fourth point to ponder that's uh, significant about the door is the sufficiency of it. The door was sufficient to save the widest animal and the tallest animal. Think about it now. Noah didn't have to worry about how wide to make it. God told him how wide to make it. He didn't have to tell him how tall to make it because God told him how tall to make it. When a giraffe came in, the giraffe had enough sense to bow its head down to get in that door. It was wide enough for the hippopotamuses and whomever, whatever came in, they came in through that door and they didn't have a problem because it was tall enough and it was wide enough for everybody to come through. So the door was sufficient to save the widest and the tallest of creatures. It reminds me of the love of God that Ephesians talks about that we're unable to understand or comprehend. And what can't we comprehend? We can't comprehend the width of it. We can't comprehend the length of it. We can't comprehend the, the height of it. We can't comprehend the depth of his love that surpasses all comprehension, surpasses all knowledge. And we're in Christ Jesus. And when you're in him, no matter how you are, no matter how you look, no matter who you are, God says, you, you can come on in here. Or like the grace of God that God told Paul was sufficient for him. The symbolism of the door is also significant because behind it were provisions for all of their needs. They didn't have to go out to catch nothing because everything they needed to eat was already on board in the ark and God had provided for their needs as well. Paul told the church, my God will supply all of your needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. The question, are, question is, are you in Christ Jesus? Once inside the ark, Noah and his family had all of their needs met. The Greek word for door is used to describe the door of Christ and the door of faith. In Acts, it's used to describe the door of opportunity in chapter 14. And in Revelation, it's an invitation to fellowship in chapter 3 and verse 20 of Revelation. It says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. Now, some people think that this is Jesus wanting to come in to save people. This is not so. He's sending a letter to the church. The church folk are already saved. The thing is, they haven't been having right fellowship with God. So he stands outside the door. I don't know if there's a knob or not, but he's knocking because he doesn't break in. He doesn't kick down the door. He only comes in when you ask him to. And so he's saying, okay, if you are a believer and, and, and you're okay not having fellowship with me, well, okay, but I'm going to try one more time. I'm standing at the door and I'm knocking. If anyone hears my voice, so apparently not only is he knocking, but he's asking to open the door. And if anyone opens the door, I will come into him and will dine with him and he with me. What is he saying? I want to have fellowship with you. I want to have fellowship and I want to come in. I want to be with you. This is what God is saying to all of us all the time. He, when we get too busy with our busyness, and we leave God out, and, and you feel dried up, and you irritable, and all that. You know why you're all irritable? It's because you haven't had any, spent any time with God. You haven't thought about God. Think about all your problems, not think about your blessings. And then you wonder why you feel so bad. Because you're thinking about the wrong things. Man, God says, come boldly to the throne of grace. To find grace and mercy to help you in your time of need. So whatever you need, God says, my, 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 my place here, where I am, is full of grace and mercy. So now, if 
we go through the door, we enter into a relationship and fellowship with God. It's through his door that we find salvation. It's through his door that we find protection. It is through his door that we find provisions. It is true the door, it is true his door uh, that, uh, that we find abundant life. It, that's what John says. It says we, and in him is abundant, is abundant life. And I love that word abundant. It means exceedingly. It means very high quality and quantity. It's considerably more than what anyone could ever expect or anticipate. That's why I love Jesus, the fact that Jesus is the door to eternal life. His door is more than a metaphor. It's a revelation of divine identity and of his divine identity and unique ability and singular exclusivity. You say, well, what does all that mean? It means this. There is salvation in no one else. It's exclusively in Christ Jesus. He's the exclusive door, the exclusive way, the exclusive truth, and the exclusive life. His door speaks of accessibility. Jesus isn't a door that's locked or hidden. He's a door, the door, that's accessible to anyone who would dare enter by faith to be saved. Now, in both exclusive and inclusive, it's both exclusive and inclusive because that's who God is. He's not prejudiced, and he includes everyone into the family. That's what the Jews could not understand. They couldn't understand how Gentiles would be a part of the, what God come for, came for the Jews. I mean, for, for, for the Gentiles too, yeah. He came to save us too. Every race, religion, no matter how wealthy you are or how poor you are, no matter what your reputation is. God says, you can't get in on your race. You can't get in on your religion. You can't get in on your wealth. You can't get in on your reputation. You can only get in by grace through faith. Now, you know, Serena Williams, she was in, well, she lives there, but she, she went to this restaurant in, in Paris, and she wanted to sit up on the balcony. They had open deal up there for a restaurant. And so she walked in, and she asked the host, you know, can I sit upstairs? And, and the host said, no, uh, ma'am, you can't. And she said, well, do you know who I am? And the host said, no, ma'am, I don't. Uh, and she said, well, why can't I sit upstairs? And, and the manager came out and said, well, ma'am, uh, the reason why is because that's already reserved. She said, well, no one's sitting up there. She said, I know, but it's the Olympics, and it's all ready reserved. She said, now, if you want to give us a reservation and someone cancels, woo. Folks, can I tell you something? You can't get into heaven because of who you are. You can't get into heaven because of how much money you got. You can't get into heaven because you got some gold medals. You can't get into heaven because you done done all this stuff on earth. You can only get into heaven by the grace of God and by faith in him and him alone. You can't use nothing else to get into heaven. And, and look, and stop trying to throw your weight around because you are a believer. Because you're a believer doesn't mean you're supposed to get a discount every time. I mean, people got to make money. They give everybody that say they're born again a discount, they're going out of business. I love what, uh, what, what the men talked about this past uh, Saturday. Uh, you know, Ken, uh, he, he was telling about, he took a car in for service, and, uh, and, and, and he took it in, and they didn't have all the parts available. But you know what they told Ken? They said, Ken, look, I'll tell you what I'll do. You can, you can take your car and drive it, and um, don't worry about paying us. Uh, we, we, look, when the other part comes in, we'll call you, come back in. Now, why did they do that for him? I tell you why they did that for him, because they knew his character. See, people don't do that for anybody's character, just anybody's character. They, if you got character, quality, people will trust you without you having to ask them. People will give you things without you even having to beg. Look, people come to church on Sunday here at New Covenant, and I thank God for you, and I thank God that you come back for second times and third times and whatever. You know what? I want you to go out, and I want you to live the life that God wants you to live. Live as if you heard a message here that made a difference in your life. 
Don't walk out of here the same way you came in if you were not born again. I want you to know the Lord Jesus Christ because I don't want you to leave out of here without knowing him. The door speaks of necessity. It's extended to anyone who's weary and burdened in need of rest. I love what the word Noah means. The word Noah means rest. Think about that. God gets a man whose name means rest to build an ark so that he can rest in it. I mean, what about that? Look, it's necessary for all who want to enter to make reservations because you can't get into heaven without receiving Christ. When you receive him, you've made a reservation to be included into the family of God. You don't have to worry about what race you are. You don't have to worry about the religion. And I don't even like that word religion. I like relationship. Wealth and reputation won't get you into heaven. Only, only uh, fellowship, our fellowship and our relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Heaven is only accessible when we go through the door. So what does all this mean? Well, it means to experience the abundant life, to experience the love and liberty that only Christ can give you. You need to respond to the invitation to be saved and respond to the invitation today. Don't put off until tomorrow because you don't even know if you're going to be alive tomorrow. You have no idea what tomorrow will bring. People we're having a great time down in Florida and down the coast and everything. And, and the next thing they knew, this hurricane was coming in. Gave it the name of a woman. You know, I tell you, just use men's names, you know. I tell you. But anyway, they're going to, trying to, they're trying to, they're trying to, trying to be so politically correct. Just call them all men names. You know, leave the ladies out of that, man. You know, so, so little kids say, oh. No, I'm afraid. What's your name? Go up to the woman whose name the, the, the hurricane is. And what's your name? Oh, mama, I'm scared of that woman. She's a hurricane. You know, can you imagine those? Yeah, I mean, you know, kids take things literally. You know that. You know? So, you know, the teacher's name has the same name as the hurricane. Mama, I don't want to go to school. Why? Because the, the, the hurricane's at school. What hurricane? Betty? <laughs> Oh, my goodness gracious. Both the door and the ark are types of Christ. For Noah to be saved from the flood of judgment, he had to enter the door. For you to be saved from the judgment that's coming, you've got to enter through the door, the door that's Christ. The significance and symbolism of Christ is he's the singular door that's open to those who choose to be saved. The ark protected Noah, and the ark of Christ protects us and provides for us like it provided for Noah. Everything they needed was there in the ark. Everything we need for life and godliness has been provided for us in the ark of Christ. So God waited patiently during Noah's time, and he's waiting patiently for many of you today who are watching us online. Those of you who walked in today, some of you may not have a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. I ask you today, make up your mind. Don't take God's grace for granted. There's nothing that's going to keep him from coming back one day, uh, you know, at any time. Whenever you see, see the clouds in the air, up in the sky, it would be a great time for Jesus to come back. You don't know when. No one knows when. But he's coming back again. And I'm telling you, some of y'all, your time is going to run out. And you think you have another day, and God's going to say, today is your day. The day is the last day of your life and you're going to be in the hospital, you've just had a bad accident, or you didn't know you had cancer, and you didn't go in and get checked up on a regular basis because you were afraid that the, the doctor would tell you that you had something, please go in. If you, if you don't go in regularly to your doctor, shame on you. If you don't have insurance or if you have insurance but don't have a deductible, call us. Will you call us? We'll, we'll find you some money. If you need to go to your doctor, I'll find you some money for the pay for your deductible. I don't want you not to go in and get checked out. 
If you're a member of our church, I want you to, I, I want you to get yourself checked. We get checked out twice a year, my wife and I. Why? It's important to me that I know that I'm healthy so that I can be here and not worry about stuff I haven't got checked out yet. You know, how, how do you know what condition you're in? You know, some of you, if you don't take your car in and get it, you get your oil changed, it's probably the same way you do your life. You don't get it checked out. And everybody knows that every 3,000 miles or so, you got to got get that oil changed. And you know what? There are times in your life when, when you feel tired and irritable that you know it's time for your body to get checked out. I pray that you'll do that. Stan, I know you didn't come in here to hear nothing about your health, but I, I just want you to know that you've got to take care of the only body that God gave you here on earth. You're not getting a second one. This is it. Better take care of it because you're going to have to give an account for how you took care of it. Now, if you have never given your life to Christ, if you've never confessed Jesus as Lord and believed in your heart that God raised him from the dead, will you come out from the seats today, if there's someone in here that wants to give their life to Christ. Online, you can go at, up to, to my, my left, uh, to your right, if you're looking at me on, on screen. Um, I want you to connect with us and, and, and give your life to Christ today. Bow your head. Father, I pray right now for anyone watching us online who's on the fence, I pray that they will trust you. I pray that they will lean on your arms, so to speak, the everlasting arms that are open wide to receive you. If you want to receive the Lord Jesus Christ today, connect with us online and let us know. If you want to see, receive Christ today, if you walked in and don't know him, please come down and let us talk to you. If you want to be a part of our fellowship officially, now, if you give, you're already, uh, you know, you have certain privileges because you give and you support our church. But I, I, I want you to think about being a part of us officially. And I don't know your birthday and your anniversaries and love to give you cards to that effect. Father, I pray right now for those who are thinking about giving their life to you. And uh, I pray you'll talk to them, even if they're riding down the street. And uh, one day you just drop in their spirit, today is the day of salvation. And they come forward to you, even as they pull off on the side or driving down the road saying, God, I receive you as my personal Lord and Savior. If anybody has been saved and never been baptized, Lord, I pray that they will come forward to let us know when we can baptize them. And I thank you so much for the family that you've given me to pastor over. I love them, and I thank you for their faithfulness to you, and I thank you for the way they take care of us. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling, to present you faultless before the only wise God, our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. And every heart that knows that Jesus is the door and the ark in their life, say amen. Amen. amen.